so tonight we're going to talk about, uh, continue our discussion of preparing for Pesach, and we are going to focus now more on the Seder itself. And so uh, this is great for not only your personal knowledge and benefit, but it's likely that you're going to be sitting at a table at the Seder, and you might have somebody at your table who this is their first time to, to be at a Seder. It might be your first time to be at a Seder, but at least you've had some some uh, some combat training as we're doing right now. So uh, I know that Katura oftentimes will try to try to be strategic in placing people at tables who can help newcomers and so on. The the Passover Seder is not necessarily uh, something that where somebody can get can get lost in per se, but it always helps to have. A, a bit of fore, a foreknowledge going into it. In fact, it's, it's kind of traditional in Ashkenaz, uh, Ashkenazi communities that the Sabbath uh, before uh, the Pesach Seder, that they will, after, uh, after the Sabbath services and everything, they will actually go through their, uh, their Haggadah to familiarize themselves with the Seder so that it's, it's not uh, you know, maybe cumbersome or what have you when it comes time to do the Seder itself. So let's talk about the Passover Seder. The word Seder means order, okay? Every Friday night, we do an Arab Shabbat Seder. It just, it means, it means order. That's what the word means literally. You can think of it in terms of a ceremony. There's a Havdalah Seder. There's the Pesach Seder. There's a Seder for Tishbaab that when we celebrate the the counting of the fruiting of the counting the fruit of the trees and so on. So the, this means seder. One of the most important mitzvahs of Passover is to what? Anybody have an idea what's the mo- one of the most important mitzvahs of? No chametz. That's a very important mitzvah. So we want to make sure and get all the chametz out of our house. Many people have been doing that uh, already. I my wife has been pulling all stuff out of our cupboard, and I opened the cupboard today, and it was like. We have no food. So apparently, we're not, the, the what is it, the, uh, the Mediterranean diet has not made it to our house yet, apparently, because everything we have is processed and fried. Okay, so all right. We, but anyway, so we're going through all that. We've got to get all the hummets out of our house, get it eaten up and so on, or give it away, whatever the, whatever the means is. Yes, Mazel. Remembering the Exodus? Yes. Speaking about it, that's what I was looking for. There, you're going good. Remembering, but telling the story. This little booklet, uh, this I'm, I made these uh, last year, had them printed up, and we have a hundred and some on. I need to get some more printed up actually. But everybody, when they show up to the seder, gets the haggadah, or some people say haggadah. The haggadah, haggadah, is how it's usually pronounced. This Haggadah is the traditional book that's used at a Passover Seder, and its purpose is to tell the story. And it takes us through the story of Passover systematically and so on. Now, this is specific to Sar Shalom. Uh, not that there's anything in there's It's fairly traditional, but uh, it is our personal Shul Haggadah. There's a million different ones. You can, I mean, there's all kinds of Haggadot that you can purchase and so on. I made this because it incorporates thoughts of Mashiach and so on, and it keeps it in a traditional manner. The thing about Judaism that is different in a, from a Jewish Hebraic uh, state of mind that is different than the Western state of mind is how we remember or how we tell stories or how we experience the divine and work through that. In, in the Western Greek mindset, if we want to learn about a frog, what we do is we go remove the frog from the pond, take it to a lab, and we dissect the frog. Okay, that's the Greek mindset. The way that the Hebrew mind understands and learns about the frog is we go to the pond and we study the frog in the pond, okay, in its environment. And so the way that we learn about and remember and tell stories is by using all of our senses, all of our five senses to do that. It's not enough just to have somebody tell a story 
and just kind of hear the story. My wife uh, talks about her Aunt Lily, who she's named for. She said, my Aunt Lily was one of those gifted storytellers. And she would tell us stories, and they were made-up stories. They were supposedly be true stories. And when my, mom, she's, my wife was a little girl, she knew they weren't true, but she believed they were true because her aunt was so good at telling the story. But she said her aunt would be very melodramatic and, and would shake plants and stuff when she was talking about Comanches, because my wife grew up down on the border of Texas and, and Mexico and back in when her aunt was a little girl, the Comanches and banditos was, were a very real threat. And so she would shake plants in the house and talk, the Comanches are coming. And she would put little feathers in her hat and in her, in her hair. When, and and my, my wife was just, just mesmerized. And so the Passover Seder is much like that. We're actually using music. We're using our, our senses, our sense of, of, of sight and touch and taste to experience what it was like going through the Exodus. And something that we must understand that is really important to the Jewish mind is that we are not telling a history story, but we are actually living out a present reality. In other words, every Jew in every generation, according to ancient thought, is to see themselves as having personally been set free from the Exodus, so that our redemption, and that's what really redemption is amount to, the, the, the Exodus is, is the paradigm for redemption. Our redemption is a present reality, not something that ha has happened. And I believe that this is partially what the apostle was referring to when he talks about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Some people get confused by, well, I thought we we're already saved when we believe in Messiah, but our, and our daily existence is an act of redemption and salvation. And so when we are going through this, we are remembering what it was like when we were making bricks. We were remembering what it was like when we were slaves, but now we're free. And so this, uh, going through the Haggadah, is very much supposed to touch every sense of our body. This is why it's... Uh, it's important when we're going through the Seder that we actually go through the motions. And so uh, our particular Seder, I mean, I don't know, people have told me uh, different things about other Seders and, and I've been through a couple of other ones. Uh, most of all the Seders I've been to, I've led. So I don't really have, I have kind of a biased perspective, okay? Um, but I've, I've been to some, some Seders. We had a guy one time who came and I thought it would be a good idea I met this guy, and he was a Jewish man, and I thought it would be a good idea to kind of change things up and let him come in and do a Seder. In fact, I, this, the reason I didn't bring the uh, jump drive is because uh, I was trying to download the, um, before we started Sar Shalom, I had started a church. And so we had a church for a number of years, and then we closed the doors on that and launched Sar Shalom. Well, the little church that we had was a uh, kind of a messianic kind of a mess. But um, <laughs> we had an anniversary thing we did, and it, it talks about our days at the barn. And there's pictures and all this other kind of stuff. And there's a picture of this very first Seder that we had done, and Miss Judy and Couture were there. And so this guy was leading that Seder. And he apparently, his, his soapbox thing was that we shouldn't use grape juice, we should always use wine. And he, while he was talking, he was continuing to drink the wine and talk about that to the, the end of his diatribe about the grape juice versus wine thing. He was three sheets in the proverbial wind and was gone. So uh, it was a very interesting Seder. But we, our Seders are very jubilant and very joyful. We have lots of music and lots of dancing and we encourage people to dance. We encourage people to celebrate because we are celebrating freedom. So telling the story is an important mitzvah. This entire event, the entire, uh, the entire festival of Pesach is all about redemption and grace. Now I should say that in, in our modern, relative modern day, actually this has been this way for a couple thousand years, we refer to this seven-week festival as Pesach. 
But how many of you know that technically, the, yes, but it's technically only one day Passover is. Passover itself is one day. The seven-day festival is the festival of unleavened bread. And then there's the festival also included in that time frame, the festival of first fruits. For roughly 2,000 years, we've, we, we refer to the entire week as Passover. Um, but you should know that technically speaking, there are three festivals within this time frame. And they are, they are uh, all have significance and importance, okay? So the entire season, whether, we're, whether it's the festival of, uh, of unleavened bread, the festival of Passover, or the festival of fruit, first fruits, it's all about redemption and grace, redemption and grace. I was reading it, I'm currently reading an incre- a wonderful book. So far it's wonderful, I'm not quite halfway uh, through with the book. The book is titled, Paul uh, Was Not a Christian, and actually Shoshana Brenner, you let me borrow it, I probably shouldn't have told you that, but um, you let me borrow it, and I'm just now getting a chance to read it. It's a fantastic book. I let you borrow it indefinitely. Oh, good, good. So it's mine. So that's good. So, so uh, it's an fe- excellent book, but she's writing, uh, the, the author is a female uh, Jewish, observant Jewish woman who is a professor who actually teaches at a Christian uh, university. And so, and she, her expertise happens to be uh, the beginnings of Christianity and, and all the history there. But she's writing about how intri- integral grace is and was in the concept of Jewish redemption. So in other words, and this is nothing new for those of us who understand and, and know Judaism, there's grace all throughout the Siddur, there's grace throughout everything because Hashem, by his grace, delivered us from Pharaoh and by his grace continues to, to protect us and keep us and, and living out the covenant is merely our part of living within his grace relationship. So keeping Passover uh, is not, it has nothing at all to do, of course, with trying to earn anything, but rather it is a response to what we already do. You know, one of the reasons, if we can just be honest, one of the reasons that, that, uh, uh, we, we men, let's just speak from our point of view, we do honeydews for our wives, we bring them flowers on, on Arab Shabbat, and we do other things. A large part of that is because we love our wives and, and, and all those kinds of things. But there's also a significant part of that that is, that's our covenantal re- re- responsibility, right? Uh, we are called to, to make provision, to, to re- the, the Torah tells us, in fact, that we are called to uh, provide our woman with clothing. Now, this is a very dangerous statement I'm about to make. I can't even believe I'm about to say it. I am so stupid for saying this, but I have to say, I have to speak the truth, okay? Do you know, in the Talmud, because of what the Torah says about providing our wife with, with clothing, that it talks about that a man should spend more than he can afford on his wife's clothing because that's his covenantal responsibility. Can you believe I just said that? I don't even know. I was, I'm just crazy. A good wife would never require that. That's right. That's the balanced side of it. Thank you, Shoshana. That is the balanced side of it. A good, godly, Torah observant wife would never allow her husband to overspend on shoes and clothing and everything. And can I get an amen on that? Amen. amen. All right. But that's true because that's our responsibility to make provision. Now, don't. She does it herself. She makes provision. But the Torah says the woman, the man is supposed to make provision for her clothing and her household and so on. But the Proverbs 31 woman, to bring balance, is, is somebody who's taking the bull by the proverbial horns, as you were saying. Now, don't allow my wife to see this. Let's edit that out, if you will, Ark. All right. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> So um, I want to share with you a quote out of this book. There's a book, by the way. There's all kinds of books on the festivals, and, and uh, there's a lot of great ones. This one is a book called The Jewish Holidays by Michael Strasfeld. Michael Strasfeld has written a lot of great books. I tend, uh, uh, probably 90% of my library is just Jewish literature. Very, very little uh, what you might call messianic literature, 
uh, even probably less Christian literature. I just, I just think that there's a great richness and depth. And this is a Jew, therefore a Jewish book about the holidays. And I, I think it's one of the best ones. Uh, there's lots of great ones, but this is one of the better ones, I think. So, you, but I'm going to read to you a, a quote from the, he, that I found in here that I thought was great. It's talking about Shabbat Haggadol. Now, Shabbat Haggadol is the Shabbat before Passover. And it's one of the four um, big, important Shabbats, Shabbats uh, leading up to Pesach, Shabbat Haggadol. Now, Shabbat Haggadol is known as the Sabbath of redemption. And on that, on that uh, day, we read Malachi 3.23. In fact, let's just turn there and I'll, let's read that particular verse because it's important with respect to Pesach, Malachi 3.23. Let's see here. That's not right. 420. No. I have written down the wrong passage. Let me see here. It's 4 5. 4 5. Malachi 4 5. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of Hashem comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with the curse. Now, what the author writes about that from a, from a Jewish traditional point of view, he, and this is a quote for the book, he says, even before we recount the redemption from Egypt at Passover, we look forward to the final redemption, which will be heralded by Elijah. So it's kind of interesting that Shabbat Haggadol is a time when we are looking forward to the final redemption. And then we're about to go and experience and remember and tell the story of when Hashem redeemed us from Egypt, which is the paradigm, the picture, the, the uh, structure, if you will, of the redemption model. And so it's very interesting. In fact, in the Talmud, it talks about that in Nisan, which is what we're talking about here, we're in the month of Nisan, that in Nisan, our forefathers were redeemed, and in Nisan, we will be redeemed. A couple other points about this I want to, leading up to the Seder, I just want to mention again about Erev Pesach, the night before Passover, we search for leaven, which is called the Bedikat Hametz. And then we have the nullification once we've gotten all of the leaven collected. We have the bitul hametz, which is the nullification where we make the declaration. We say, all leaven in my possession, whether I've seen it or not, whether I have removed it or not, is hereby nullified and ownerless as the dust of the earth. And then the following morning, before 10 a.m. in the morning, we have the bir hametz, which is the destruction of the hametz, where we go and physically burn uh, whatever hametz that we've collected. The, uh, um, and I, as I said, by this time, we've already really gotten all the hametz out of the house, but now we're talking about the piles of breadcrumbs and things that we've collected. And this is particularly poignant if you have children, but even if you don't have children, I think that we all need to do this practice because it's so much such a spiritual uh, magnification. And there's a prayer uh, that is, is cited as we're burning the, the leaven, and the prayer is, Adonai, our God and God of our fathers, just as I have removed all hamets from my home and from my ownership, so may it be your will that I merit the removal of the evil inclination from my heart. So as we're going through the process of destroying the hamets, we're now making a prayer that Hashem will destroy the hamets that's in our, our heart. Okay, as we're getting ready to go on the, to pass Pesach. And I want to share another custom with you that is so beautiful and so wonderful. And that is that uh, if you still have, and some of us do, your lulav, the palm branch or the, the myrtle leaves from the lulav that we used in, in um, uh, tabernacles, it is customary to use that or part of it to kindle the fire for burning the chametz. And the reason is, the thought behind it is, is that everything in Judaism that Hashem has given us is cyclical. And every ending has a beginning. 
okay? So that when we, we, we end the festival seasons with tabernacles and we come right back to Pesach and begin again using elements from that season. So that, everything, so that we're, we learn that every time there's an ending, there's an immediate beginning. This is teaching us, of course, about the Olam Haba. It's just like when we, when we end the Torah portion readings, we, uh, the very day that we read about the death of Moshe, and that's the final Torah portion reading, it is customary on that very same day to read the first few verses of Breshit so that in every ending, there's a beginning. Isn't that awesome? Yes, Miss Judy. Yes, that's very true. And we're supposed to remember that fact that the whole reason that we have the, the, the holy days is to remember the cycles of life. It's, also, it's everything in Hashem's uh, economy is like an, an onion, you know, it's peeling back the onion. There's many, many layers. You can't say, well, this means just this. It doesn't quite work out. It means a lot of different things. It means, it means the cycle of life. It means what Hashem has done, what he's, what he's doing now, what he's going to do in the future. If you look at the, the flow of the Jewish holidays and you compare them, not to be critical, but let's just compare them to the traditional Christian holiday cycle. So in the Christian holiday cycle, you have the celebration of the birth of Messiah at a time called Christmas. And then you have uh, the, the time of, of Easter, which is supposed to represent remembering the resurrection. And so... I guess you could say uh, during the Easter holiday, perhaps there is an emphasis that's placed on people uh, getting saved, which would include, you know, asking for forgiveness and so on. But that's basically it. You have those two holidays, and, and they're what? Uh, East, I mean, Christmas is in December. Easter is in April. It's roughly four months apart. Okay, that's it. So then you have the entire rest of the year where there's basically nothing. Okay. And that's true, there's Pentecost, but that's usually only, that, that's only mentioned if you happen to be in a Pentecostal church. If you're not in a Pentecostal church, it is Sunday. Okay? Um, and so there's no, other, there's no other cycle. But let's look at the cycle that Hashem gave us. Beginning with the first thing off the bat, we have Pesach, where our entire focus is remembering His mighty act of redemption and getting the hamets out of our out of our soul and out of our homes and it's 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 like uh, the entire event both spiritually and physically is an entire cleansing process let's my house right now I told you my wife is already in the process of clearing out our cupboard and I've been I'm like the let's eat hamets police okay <laughs> so so my wife is like what do you want for dinner we're having breaded fish tonight you know why because that's what's in the freezer and it's got to go so we're having breaded fish and we're having rum and cokes. No, I'm just kidding. But um, we're having breaded fish. You know, here we go. So, but when I was li- tonight, or this this afternoon, I was looking and I was thinking, you know, we're we're cleaning up. We're we're slowly but surely, uh, you know, cleaning out corners and I'm in the garage even uh, this uh, couple days ago throwing some stuff away. And it's like a physical and spiritual cleansing that happens during that time frame. Then you go to Shavuot, and now you're celebrating the, the Word of God. You're celebrating the outpouring of His Spirit, the Word of God. You're remembering that, that event and your, your entire focus. When we get to Shavuot, we spend an entire night, I mean, we, the entire night, we spend studying Torah. We, we praying and studying Torah. I mean, we just stay up all night long. And, well, maybe not all night long, but well into the wee hours of the morning studying Torah. Then we come through the summer. We come to the festival of, uh, of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. And we are celebrating the coronation of the king, remembering what, who he is and what he's coming to do. And looking forward to the resurrection of the dead and the Olam Mahaba. Then we go right into a period of 10 days of... Oh, actually, let me back up before we even, I should have said, before we even get to Yom Teruah, beginning on the first of Elul, we blow the shofar in the, in the synagogue every day for 30 days, and we're leading up to the Feast of Trumpets, and we are reminding ourselves through Hashem's voice 
to repent, to turn away from a life of sin. And that's the time when we all, we tell, uh, tell the congregation, if somebody's got ought against you, this is the time to go to them. This is the time to seek their forgiveness. This is the time to make amends and so on and so on. Then we get to Yom Teruah. And then after Yom Teruah, we have 10 days of, of intense repentance and, and really pouring our heart out to Hashem and seeking his cleansing. And then we get to Yom Kippur, where we have the day of fasting and, and the day of judgment, as it were, where we're praying and, and just seeking Hashem to, to cleanse us and purify our nation and purify our shul. And then we move right from that into the festival of Sukkot, where we're remembering what it is like and what it's going to be like to live in Hashem's presence. And by the way, that's where we celebrate properly the birth of Messiah, because he was born at that time, not in December. And we have this time where we fellowship, we go out and live in community for a week. It's fantastic. And then we come right back a, a few weeks later, and we have the minor holiday of Hanukkah, where we're reminded about his deliverance, and we have Purim, and we're right back in the cycle. We don't have time to forget because we're living it the entire year. There is no, like, eight-month break before the next holiday. In fact, we've made jokes at Sar Shalom that we, after a holiday, we have about a week's worth of rest. Now we're gearing up for the next holiday. We just celebrated Purim, had a great time at Purim. What a great, uh, wonderful experience that all was. And now, I mean, within a few days, we're sitting down, you know, making our final prep for Pesach. It's just fantastic. Any questions about that, any, by the way? It's kind of a it's kind of a run through of all the festivals right there. Is there a handy handout that you have? A handy handout. Uh, let me. Okay, great. So let me uh, run through the seder right quick and ex explain kind of the elements. Again, this is the Haggadah. This is the the booklet, and the way that will work is that as we're going through the 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 seder, there are parts in the Haggadah where I am speaking as the leader, and then there, in the Haggadah, there's a, a underlined, bolded, where it says all, and this is where we say this all together, okay? And this is, again, to be participatory. This is, people are there, we're all there to experience this together, and so the, the Word of God says in Exodus 6, 6 through 7, it says, therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am Adonai, I will free you from the forced labor of the Egyptians, rescue you from their oppression, and redeem you with an outstretched arm with great judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am Adonai, your God, who freed you from the forced labor of the Egyptians. From this verse, the ancient sages got the, the concept that we are to partake of four cups of wine during the Pesach Seder. So, now it could be, for those who don't want or don't like wine, it can be uh, kosher grape juice. But it must be the fruit of the vine one way or the other. But we partake of four cups of wine during this Seder, which is exactly what, of course, Mashiach was doing at what is commonly and, and unfortunately mistakenly called the Last Supper. Should have been called the Last Seder or the Last Passover, but, but due to, quite frankly, anti-Semitic leanings, it's called the Last Supper. Okay, but it wasn't. It was the last Seder is what he was having. This is, uh, in fact, at the very last part of the Seder, you, we sing songs, we sing the traditional Hallel, and it talks about in the Gospels that they went out on their way to the garden singing. That's because they were singing the Hallel. They, it's, it's what they were doing. It's all part. It talks about whoever dips with me is the one who will betray me. Well, he wasn't just having some, you know, bread and and olive oil and balsamic vinegar, you know, this wasn't, they weren't at the olive garden, they were dipping one of the traditional prescribed dips, as it were, that's what he was saying, okay. I always think it's interesting when you show people that are having the last Seder plays or the, or, or uh, renditions in a movie or something, and there's Yeshua, uh, he's at the Last Supper, and he's breaking a big old yeasty loaf of bread, Right? Yeah. The only problem was there's no comets. So it would not have been, it would have been a little cracker. Okay? So there's four cups of wine that we'll drink. And just so you know at the Seder, 
you're supposed to drink the, the glass completely and refill it. That's the mitzvah, not to sip it and put it back down, but to drink the whole thing. So we tell people when you fill your cup with wine, particularly, or grape juice, only put a few ounces in there, okay? You don't want to do like, okay, you don't want to have the chug a half bottle of wine, right? So just keep that in mind and, and help your people at the table know when you see them, you know, just a little few glasses because we're going to drink a little bit of it. Everybody is going to have in front of them a Seder plate. Now, a Seder plate traditionally is a decorative plate that has specific places to put the elements. However, halakhically speaking, a Seder plate can be any plate. So you don't have to have a Seder plate. If you were doing this at home and you didn't have a Seder plate, you don't have to have a traditional Seder plate. We will have a big, beautiful, gorgeous, traditional Seder plate at the head table, but we can't afford 300 Seder plates. So everybody will have a plate in front of them. It's a regular plate. We'll have the Seder elements on there. So the Seder elements that will be on your plate will be the carpus, number one, which the carpus is the uh, parsley. That's a little sprig of parsley, okay? You will also have on your plate harosip, which is a delicious blend of, of chopped nuts, apples, wine. My wife is, usually makes the harosip, and she puts dates in there and cinnamon, and a little bit of honey, I think, and it's delicious. It's like this mortar. It looks like mortar. It looks like clay, but it's delicious, okay? You will also have maor, which is the bitter herbs, which you have a choice. And it gets a little bit confusing. If you ever look at a Seder plate, you'll see a leaf of lettuce on a Seder plate in a lot of the pictures, and we'll have a, a leaf of romaine lettuce on our Seder plate at the head table, but you don't really use it because the maror, you have a choice between romaine lettuce or fresh ground horseradish sauce or horseradish. And I choose horseradish because we want the impact. Romaine, I mean, romaine, what's that, you know? That's, that's for like northern, eastern Scandinavian Jews. We want, we want fresh more. So we have the bitter herbs, and we use horse, horseradish for the effect. Now, on a lot of uh, Seder plates, this has been true in post-biblical times, post-Messiah. Post you have a, uh, a roasted egg, which is, has many different symbols of, I've read through the years. It's supposed to symbolize, some say, the destruction of the temple. Some say it uh, symbolizes the Corban offering. We do not use, in our Seder, we don't use the, the roasted egg. The reason that we don't primarily is because we have so many people who are coming from the Great Egg God Festival, yes. and we don't want any confusion whatsoever, okay? Uh, so we don't, we, don't want any, we don't want them to think that, oh, well, the egg comes from Judea. No, it doesn't. That's a totally different thing, but it's too difficult to try to make that distinction, so we just leave it out. It's not really important anyway. And so that, that it is what it is. But just so you know, if you're ever looking at a Seder plate and you see the roasted egg, and if your friend asks you, how come you don't use a roasted egg, you can tell them. You can tell them, well, you know, there's the Easter thing, and that's totally pagan. Has, and we're not, you know, that's documented paganism. And we don't want anybody to get confused. That's really what it amounts to. Um, the other thing that's on the plate, it was on the head plate, will not be on your plate as you're sitting there, and that is the roasted lamb shank. Okay. Zeroa, as it's called, the roasted lamb, lamb shank, and I will hold this, the lamb shank bone up and talk about it at the appropriate time in the Seder, but it won't be on your plate, and usually it's a pretty decent sized bone. We go to the kosher butcher at Pesach, everybody is going there to get the lamb shank bone, so they have a bunch of them, they give it to you, and it's, it's uh, all good. The other item, of course, is the matzah. This will be on the table, and they, I, I didn't, wasn't thinking I should have brought a piece of matzah. Most of us have seen it, but the matzah is the big square cracker that is both striped and pierced, and it's been made that way for, like, ever, practically. So the matzah is an unleavened piece of bread. Basically, when you make bread that doesn't have leaven in it, and you make it to the right uh, specifications, you get a cracker. It's a big cracker that's been striped and pierced. And so we will 
uh, use, of course, matzah, and we'll, you know, there's a point in the Seder where there's a special um, uh, piece of material that has three pockets in it, and you take, it has three pieces, three loaves of matzah, you take the middle loaf out, you break it in half, put one half back into the mix, and you take the one half that's broken and you wrap it in a linen cloth and all the children close their eyes under pain of death and somebody goes and hides that matzah with the linen wrap around it and it's called, it's actually a Greek word which is kind of interesting, called afikomen. And afikomen means he who comes last. And so it's hidden away and at the end of the Seder we have all the children come forward and I commission them to go and find the afikomen. And whoever finds the afikomen comes to the leader of the Seder, and they are given silver coins as a reward. Okay? There is so much to that. Don't, get, don't, don't jump on it. Don't jump on it. And then we partake of the afikomen. Now, we try to make the literal afikomen that we find last as long as it will. Okay? And we tell everybody to just take a little piece of it. Uh, you would think that we couldn't feed 300 people with a little piece of matzah like this. But we have done it before. And so it's really neat. So that, that's all part of the Seder. These are the elements. There's another element on your Seder plate. And it's the salt water. And early in the Seder, one of the first things we do is we take the carpus, which is the parsley. We dip it in the salt water. And we eat it. Now the parsley itself, if you ever had just raw parsley, it's bitter. It's not the sweetest of uh, vegetables. And when you dip it in the salt water, you have that bitter salt water taste. And it's supposed to represent to us the tears that we shed when we're in bondage. And so again, remember, we're getting all of our senses in here. And so we are, we're, we're, we're putting this, this, this herb in our mouth that has salt water. And we're remembering how we cried tears when we were in bondage. Yes, Kefa. I've, I don't do it twice in my Seder, personally. I've always done it twice for that. I, I haven't yet, but I can, we can drink the salt water too. No, I'm just kidding. But no, I haven't. I haven't. I have not done it twice, so I haven't. Well, one, one is the tears, obviously, and the yeah. second one is, you know, kind of the, it's sad. I mean, the whole the army yeah. destroyed, yeah. Okay. and it's a little bit of joy and a little bit of, you know, Bitter. remembrance. Well, and, and, to, and to that point, when we get, the, when we get to the, the, the four cups, one of the cups is the cup of plagues. And it's traditional to dip our, our pinky finger into our wine glass and bring out a drop for each and every plague. And the reason we do that is because the, cup, or the full cup of wine represents joy. And we are sad because Hashem had to bring justice and judgment upon the Egyptians. So we remove 10 drops of joy from our cup because of the 10 plagues before we drink it. So that's, again, remembering that. I haven't done the water for the Pharaoh's army part, but that's it's pretty, it's pretty a neat idea. Something else we do at the Seder is we recline. We're supposed to eat reclining. In our day and age, it's a little bit difficult to do when we have modern chairs, at, at seders that are done at homes, it's not uncommon for people to bring pillows to the table so that they can, in their seat, lean back on a pillow or lean to the side or whatever. I always tell people at our seder, when we first get started, everybody lean to your left. We are reclining tonight. And the tradition was, is that in antiquity, if you were a slave, you had to stand and, and eat standing and always be, you know, at the, at the master's bidding. If you were free, then when you sat at your table, you reclined. And so we are free. We're eating as free men and free women on this night. And so we're eating reclining. We also have Elijah's cup, which we have usually at the head table. And then it's traditional to have one of the children go out at some point and look to see if Elijah is coming. Some people um, from a believing community have objected and say, well, Elijah's already come and 
through yoking on the immerser. So should we, shouldn't we exclude that from our Seder? And I say, no. He came in the spirit of Elijah. But it talks about that there will be a literal coming of Elijah who heralds in the, mess, the, the Messiah who comes for a second time. May it be soon. And so we are still looking for Elijah to come and say, he's here. And so, hey, we have a blood moon. Who knows what will happen? Amen? So, uh, and also one thing about the... Uh, I wanted to make mention of, and that is that it is traditional but not required to wear white at the Pesach Seder. So this becomes sometimes a point of angst for a lot of people because uh, it just is what it is. A lot of people do wear white. You're going to walk into a sea of white, okay? So uh, it's not required to wear white, but I want you to know that a lot of people will be wearing white. For a man... You might be able to find a, a white suit. Some uh, one year I wore just a white, I had a white linen jacket and black trousers. And white kippas are very, very uh, common and traditional. Something else that is very traditional for the head of household, and that is to wear the kittel. Now the kittel or the kittel is like a, a it's a, like a white linen robe. When a Jewish man gets married in Orthodox setting, he gets married in this robe, and from that point forward, he wears that at every holiday. So Pesach, Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, etc. He wears that when he leads. And eventually, if Mashiach tarries, he'll be buried in that. Okay? So the kitel for the head of household is also very common. That's what I wear. Um, I, have, I wear a suit and then I'll just put the kitel over it. And so it's like a, a white robe. You can you used to be able to get them at the Judaica store in Dallas before they closed, but now you'd have to have to order one. And so it's like I said, it's just a white robe, and that's very common. So if you can, if you have it, if you're if you are the head of your house, a male head of your house, you can um, get a kittel and wear it, uh, or you can find uh, some kind of white clothing to wear. Um, I think mine is linen. Some of them are mixtures of linen and polyester. And yes, ma'am. No, just the male, a married, a married man head of his house. Uh, because presumably a an unmarried man has not worn the kittel yet to get married, so therefore it's not worn. There's other things about the Haggadah as we're going through. We're going through the the elements. There is the four questions that children are supposed to ask, which is really the focal point, one of the focal points of the entire event. People ask me all the time, is it okay for children to come to the Seder? And I was like, yeah, that's like the whole point. In fact, in Judaism, one of the Jewish laws with respect to Pesach is you're supposed to have your Seder as close to sundown as possible so that children can stay up as long as possible. Yes, ma'am. At what age? Is is any age? I mean, yes, because the pa the Pesach is about teaching the children, so all age are welcome, okay, and, and encouraged to come. Now, I mean, if you've got like a really really rowdy you know um, child, I mean, it, it's up to you if you think you might want to have like a, a, a sitter. But for Ariella, I mean, it'd be great for her to be there. She's little, but the sights and sounds and smells of Pesach, something she needs to grow up with. And so Pesach is about the children teaching that generation. It's very, very important. Hence, we have children who come forward and read the four questions. So here's the four questions. This year, we're going to have our children read them and maybe sing them in Hebrew and in English. All right? So... The first question is, on all other nights, we eat bread or matzah. On this night, why do we only eat matzah? Okay. The second question is, on all other nights, we eat all kinds of vegetables. On this night, why do we eat only bitter herbs? The third question is, on all other nights, we do, we do not dip our vegetables even once. On this night, why do we dip them twice? And then finally, on all other nights, we eat our meals sitting or reclining on this night, why do we eat only reclining? And so the entire rest of the Seder is answering those four questions. You know, the scripture that says train up a child in the way that he should go, mm -hmm. this is part of that. 
Absolutely. <laughs> right, we do do it twice. But anyway, you know, in, in the Christian world, they don't understand the dynamic of what was being quoted, train up a child. Yes, train up a child, yeah. That's right. Because it's part of the fabric of who they are. You think about it, if you follow the feast schedule that I, I uh, lined out earlier, at what point can you forget about Hashem? I mean, all year long, which is, it's a laser focus. Yeah. Because they're always trying to figure out how to do that. Right, exactly. That's a good point, John. And, and, and I remember those days, too. And I used to be, back in a former life, I used to be one of those big advocates. And then I had a funny sensation one time. I was thinking about all the festivals, and then more poignantly about Hanukkah, even, because Hanukkah falls in that same time frame. There's never a time where you have to say, even about Hanukkah, or Purim, for that matter, Let's let's try to keep God in this. I mean, I mean, you know, you know it's like, you know, it, that, it's that's such a foreign concept because He's in the center of everything that we do. S yes, Miss Judy. Oh, talk about that, you know, you're keeping Hashem in, the, in, in everything. It, it, it so proves too that He is faithful to us. Uh, it was neat a piece of trivia that I learned this week is that they can find the rabbis can find no during any of the pilgrim festivals that any of the villages were attacked mm -hmm. by men and a women or away from the home. There you go. Not, not no home. no record of, of any molestation or attack when they were gone. It's amazing. At, after we've completed answering the, the, the questions, we have the reading of the Passover story. So actually during the Seder, we're going to read the scripture and read through the Pesach story. And then, before we start our meal, uh, and this goes back, this goes, goes by, by the way, fairly quickly. We, especially at Sar Shalom, it's lively and we keep it clipping along. But we have one of the most, I think, one of the most moving parts of the Seder. And that is when we articulate the Dayenu. Where we say, we begin the Dayenu, which means it would have been enough. That's what Dayenu means. It would have been enough. It says, if Hashem had only rescued us, but had not judged our oppressors. And then everybody says, Deinu. If he had only destroyed their gods, but had not part of the Red Seas, Deinu. And we go down this list of everything he's done for us. And to me, it's one of the most moving parts of the Seder when we realize that everything he did for us, every step, that would have been enough. But he went further. It, that would have been enough. But he went further. And it's such a moving part. Now, oftentimes we sing it, maybe we can do something. I'll talk to Shoshana, we can do some, and Chris, maybe we can do a little canting of the Danu after we've done, we'll, we'll talk about that, figure out the best way to make that happen. And so um, we have, after that, the cup of redemption, which is the third cup. That's the cup that Mashiach held up and said, this is the blood of the renewed covenant, etc. We have the Afikoman, I told you about the children, go and find the Afikoman and bring it to me. And then... Uh, we finally have the last cup, the cup of praise, where we sing or say, rather, Psalm 113 and some of the other verses of Hillel, and do the final cup, and we say, next year in Yerushalayim, amen. And then we have the entire house erupts into a party that lasts until the wee hours of the morning. All right, so dancing it's awesome. And dancing and all, not really the wee hours, you'll all must leave at a certain time, but... Uh, yeah, I'll find out for sure. I'm not exactly sure. The violin guy, we have a violin. The violin guy will be there and we'll be providing exceptional uh, music on the violin. And we also this year will have the added blessing of a full-fledged worship team that will be doing a lot of live music during the Seder. It's going to be off the fleet and the dance ministry. We're going to have a center floor for dancing, and it's just going to be, it's just going to be crazy. And don't forget it's Shabbos the next day. Yeah. Yes, thank you for remembering that. The very next day is a, is a high holy day. It's a Shabbat. A lot of folks are uh, getting a hotel at the hotel, hotel room at the hotel. 
And there's going to be a special rate. It's going to be like $99 a night to do that. I haven't confirmed that with the hotel, but that's what they did for us last year. 99 yeah. It's a suite, by the way. It's per room at the Hilton. It's a, uh, that's what they gave it for to us last time, last year. So I'm going to confirm that tomorrow with them. And it is a suite. I think all the rooms are suites there. I think they are suites, but anyway. Uh, but that was nice. We did that last year. At the end of the Seder, we went upstairs. So that was fantastic. Yes, ma'am. I do have a question that niggles me. And really? I, yeah. And How long has that been happening? For ever oh, since okay. I was first introduced to Passover. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So in Exodus, it says that you are to take the lamb and to sacrifice it. And then you are to eat of it and leave nothing over until the next day. Okay, so does that happen on the day portion of the 14th? And then how does that tie in with the sacrificing of the Sabbath lambs? Because if Yeshua had his Seder the night before, he had it on the eve of Pesach. Right. But then he died. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So... You know, that whole portion... Well, there's always... Okay, there's... there's With the chronology of how things unfolded, there was always these questions because the gospel accounts uh, seemingly aren't really clear. What's interesting is in the Talmud and the Tractate Sanhedrin, the rabbis tell us explicitly that Yeshua was crucified on the 14th of Nisan. The day, the day they, I mean, when... when uh, uh, it says Arab Pesach, 14th of Nisan, when all the other lambs were crucified, or excuse me, uh, offered up. He was offered up. Now, they are, in that particular portion, that's one of the few parts of the Talmud where Yeshua is even mentioned. But in that particular part, they are discounting his Messiahship. Okay, they're saying he, he, was, he was a false Messiah, based on what they were saying. There's only like three sentences. But at the same time, they're also validating the fact that he was crucified on the 14th of Nisan. So according to, and that's probably, I mean, that's, we might as well, that's as close as we can get to have a reporter on the scene, okay? Because that's uh, you know, second century writing. So uh, to answer your question, according to that source, he was on the 14th of Nisan. That's when the lambs were offered up on the 14th of Nisan. So the, Well, not necessarily. It's between the evenings, and, the, and, and that there's been a lot of debate about See, that's when what that. I'm curious because you know, at, at, you know, in the Exodus account, they, they sacrificed at sundown, as it were, whatever they had. Mm-hmm. And then they left. You know, so how does the modern day structure of that? Because you know, people ask me, well, but you know, if he, you know, and, and how do you answer that? Well, you know, we've always been told that he's the sacrifice lamb. Right. But you know, you mentioned something a while back, the fact that there are various sacrifices being made throughout the day on the day of the fourteenth. Correct. And he was the evening sacrifice. Well, First of all, spiritually speaking, Yeshua spiritually represents all of the sacrifices. I understand that, but we're speaking specifically of the Correct. Pesach, right? But on the day of Pesach, which would be the, four, the, the, the 14th, okay? The 14th. No, no, the, the day of the 14th, on that day. Okay. They're going to sacrifice the, the lambs for Pesach specifically that afternoon. Think of it like afternoon. And then everybody will take them home to their houses. And the reason, so the way it would work is they'd have the normal Corbin offering in the morning at 9 o'clock. The usual Corbin Ola offering that happens at 3 o'clock, they moved up to noon. Okay? Correct. The reason they did that is because at 3 o'clock, they were open up the gates for everybody bringing their lambs. And they had every single priest that, on duty because they would have had probably hundreds of priests there because there's hundreds of lines of people bringing their lambs to be slaughtered and they're going home with them. And so they're, 
they're eat, they're having their satyrs with the with the roasted lamb that evening. Okay. So me with my quirky love of details. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Pesach Exodus then is the fourteenth day, right? That they kill the lambs and then they eat the Pesach overnight, leading into the fifteenth. Right, and the fifteenth being the very next day, right? And so that's what we do. We eat the Pesach over the transition from fourteen into fifteen. Correct. So, so the very next day is a high holy day. So he had his Passover Seder the day early because he was going to be the Passover sacrifice. Well, because I mean, well, the 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 evening you look at before, Torah, technically, yeah. before, technically, you can start having a Passover lamb on twilight of the fourteenth. That's the only thing that's strictly in Torah. Right. So you could have a Passover on the fourteenth evening right. and be perfectly that. in line with Torah. I totally understand so there's that. There's no but, issues there. But I, but my quirky is I'm trying to get things worked out because. Sure. Technically, you could say that he had it a day early, but as Kaif is trying to say, it's really the same. It's really the same day. So. Right, there's a high, yeah, which yeah, people see, miss. Right, see, that's, that was the, you know, that was a niggling. Yes, a, amen. Thank you. All right, now we cleared that up. Yes, Chris. With that, you know, even a first grader can figure out that there's no way you can get three days three nights. Right. 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 And so what about, what about any of that applies? Those, those customs were specific to that particular event, right? So uh, in today, in, in modern, in, in biblical times and in modern times, that the Jewish people did not eat with the staff in their hand and, and gird it. And the reason is, is because they're, at that time, they're experiencing the literal Passover and getting ready to be redeemed from Israel, I mean Egypt, and this from that moment, from that day forward, we've already been redeemed. So we're, there's no need to have a staff in our hand because we're already in that present. Now, from a eschatological point of view, in the Alam Haba, we could say that there's a spiritual redemption coming, but we're clothed for that, so to speak, already through Messiah. So we don't have that. That's why, and it's not. I mean, that one time somebody showed up at our seder. And they weren't from our group. They were uh, somebody who was a guest. And they had the staff in the hand and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's great symbolism, but it's not requ a requirement for the elements of the Seder. Yeah.